we made it to New York City. Every time I'm in this city, I find myself asking the same question. Why is this place so giant? Why does NYC feel like the epicenter of the world? Are you kidding? Back in the 70s, the New Yorker magazine made this map, showing how New Yorkers see the country. I grew up in rural Oregon, and so this map sort of resonated with me. I felt like New York had this outsized presence in our country, that everyone thought that the United States was New York, like it had some sort of huge pull on everyone's mind. And when I say huge, I don't mean the eight and a half million people that are packed into this city. I also mean the outsized cultural gravity of this city. It seems like every other movie I watch or book I read is somehow connected to New York City. So as we biked around the city and had socially distanced hangouts with our friends, and as we ate the delicious things the city has to offer, I started to go down this rabbit hole of how this city came to be and how it became so damn big. This is New York, the world's largest city. So I've boiled it down to three reasons. The three reasons why New York City is so big and important. Number one, water. Let's look at a map real quick because, you know, I like to look at maps. The growth of New York City is primarily a story of perfect access to water. Look at where it is compared to the Atlantic Ocean. It's not right on the ocean, like it's not a beach. You've got this nice long island called uh, Long Island protecting it from the elements and from invaders. Zoom in and you see that Stanton Island is also here to protect the city from the wrath of the sea or from conquerors. And yet Manhattan is just this tiny skip away from the ocean for any boat faring person who wants to come and go. Plus, these waters are super deep, creating nice deep ports which don't freeze during the winter. They allow for loads of traffic from bigger and bigger boats. The first Europeans to arrive and settle this land were the Dutch, who were no strangers to the economic advantages of controlling water. In fact, I made a whole video about how the Dutch are obsessed with controlling water. So anyway, the Dutch arrive and they see this prime piece of land and they're like, yep, this is a sweet piece of land. We need this piece of land. Let's name it after our favorite city back home that also has amazing access to water. And New Amsterdam was born. The Dutch taking over this piece of land is really the beginning of the modern history of New York. And I wanna tell you that story, but first I wanna tell you about today's sponsor, which is Morning Brew. It is a daily newsletter that you get in your email. It's free Monday through Saturday, and it is a fantastic way to get informed about today's business news. I tend to wake up in the morning and sort of just roll over and grab my phone and just take the path of least resistance. Usually that's like opening up Instagram and just sort of scrolling to start my day. It's not really the best way to feel good about your morning. What Morning Brew is, is a better way to start your day. Morning Brew is a digest of the most relevant and interesting news in business, finance, and tech. Morning Brew does not focus on politics. It's accessible. It's like someone like me, who's not like a business insider or a finance guy, can read this and feel like I'm more informed about what's happening in the economy and what's happening in big business deals and sports and things that I don't follow super closely but feel like I have access to through this really concise newsletter. So I'm a big fan of what they're doing. It is free. It happens every day, Monday through Saturday. There's a link in my description where you can sign up. Thank you, Morning Brew, for supporting this channel. And let's get on with the story. What are the Dutch up to on the island of Manhattan? As always, there were people living on this land who were not really familiar with the concept of owning plots of land, which clearly belonged to the earth, duh. And so the Dutch arrive and are like, oh, so you don't mind if we buy this land from you and exploit it to get super rich? And so the Dutch paid the natives $24, and now the Dutch begin to control this little plot of land that is so perfectly connected to and protected from the water. They kept the original name that the Algonquian people had given this island, which was Manhata. And then they named their surrounding areas after Dutch names like Brooklyn and Bronx. The British eventually took over this piece of land from the Dutch and renamed it after one of their own cities that had nothing to do with water. And after a few years of settling this land, the British really started leveling up when it came to controlling the water. 
They started navigating up this river called the Hudson River so that they could connect with the newly constructed Erie Canal, which went all the way to the Great Lakes. And so now you have this one city that has protected access to the Atlantic Ocean, as well as to the Great Lakes all through water. Okay, so perfect access to water is number one, and the main reason why New York City became so huge. Number two is that New York became the world's factory. So it's the 1800s, and there are three industries that are really taking over the world. Number one is the mass production of clothing. Number two is the publishing of books, since there's all this sciencey stuff going on and people want to write it down and publish it and share it and everyone wants to get really smart. And number three was the refining of sugar, which European powers were stealing from all over the world to feed the growing obsession with sugar back home. These three have something in common. They require some raw material to be shipped in somewhere, to be transformed or refined or rearranged, and then shipped out as a final product to customers all over the world. To us in the 21st century, this seems super obvious that our products would travel around the world to be transformed and manufactured before they end up with us. But back in the 1800s, a global interconnected supply chain was sort of a newish thing, and New York City was uniquely placed to take advantage of this new process. To add to this momentum, back in Britain, they were kind of pissed off that their settlers had declared independence from them and then had beat them in a war. So as a matter of pride, they sort of refused to trade with any of the major revolutionary cities like Philadelphia or Boston. So this meant that New York City was the place to do global business, and the city exploded with industry. This boom in factories and industrial production is really what built this city. From the actual buildings and infrastructure to the population, as workers flocked to the city for jobs. Which gets me to my next point. The third and potentially most important element that built the New York City that we know today is immigration. As this city became the industrial hub for making stuff for people around the world, a steady flow of immigrants started flowing into New York City, mainly from Europe at first. Some of them were fleeing war or oppression, starvation, and some were just looking for a new life, to take a risk, to try something new. And New York was there to meet them. So millions of immigrants started to flow into New York City, many getting on ships and arriving on this island. By 1860, almost 70% of adults in New York were foreign born, 70%. These immigrants didn't just fill the jobs of the industrial and commercial growth of New York City. This influx of immigrants from so many different backgrounds began to lay the foundation of the incredibly diverse multicultural experience that is New York City today. But even though they all came from different backgrounds, they also had one thing in common. Immigrants tend to be a self-selecting group of risk takers. After all, they made the long, arduous journey into the unknown to start a new life. In other words, they're natural entrepreneurs. Look what we found. Best tacos on the East Coast. Because they're just like Tijuana. Here we go. Good. Now let's go to that park. Num num. Yeah. So you take a bunch of risk takers and you gather them into one large growing city to build a new life. And that creates a culture of its own, a culture of new ideas, new businesses, new inventions. And when you have a bunch of new businesses and new inventions and new ideas, you often have rich people show up to try to bet on those ideas, to see whose idea will actually win with the intention of making money on a successful idea or invention. I'm using a bunch of words to describe the process of investing or finance. For many years in the United States, the epicenter for banks and lenders was Philadelphia. But as New York City filled up with entrepreneurial immigrants, the epicenter of investing slowly shifted to the place where the best bets were happening, and New York City became the financial epicenter. All of the industrial production and factories eventually went away. But the banks and the stock exchange that were built on its shoulders stayed and became the economic foundation of modern day New York. This explanation of New York City helps me understand the more elusive mystique about this place. And that its pull isn't just about the eight and a half million people that live here. 
but that those many people, their stories, where they came from, the lives they built here, all from different backgrounds, and yet they were all engaged in the same experiment, cramming into this city to build something that had never been built before. New York City is as amazing in its own way as the Grand Canyon. New York City. New York City. New York City. So there you have it. New York City is a place that had a perfect connection to the water, that was perfectly placed to be the world's factory as the global economy started to blossom. All of this attracting risk-taking immigrants who built the population, but also planted the seeds for the uniquely New York character that we know today. 